Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this month's Living with Parkinson's Meetup. I'm Chris Kruger, Program Manager for Educational Content at the Davis Finney Foundation. And like our panelists, I live with Parkinson's. I was diagnosed when I was 37 in uh, 2020. Okay, so today we're going to be doing a question and answer session. And um, we're going to pick up some questions that we've had in from previous meetups and some questions we got that are new. But before we get started, I want to ask the panelists who are here to introduce themselves and maybe share an answer to the first question of the day, which is one we received very recently, which is uh, basically, what did you look for or what do you look for if you're pursuing uh, treatment with a neurologist for Parkinson's? So uh, I'll just answer that question real quick. I was looking for somebody who was active in reading current research when I was looking for my neurologist. Um, I wanted somebody that was up on the latest information that was out. So uh, that was that's my answer. And um, Heather, since you since you uh, are the person I see on my screen right now, how about you go go next and just give us a quick introduction and what did you look for in your neurologist? Hi, Heather Kennedy, living in the Bay Area with Parkinson's. I write as Kathleen Kiddo. I'm so happy to be here among this panel. I learned so much from every person here. And I just want to add that part because it's really important for you to know that this is a support group for us. So thanks for being here and supporting us. And thank you. We hope to support you too. It all works together. It's a collaboration. So uh, a neurologist, I think part of that answer imply or includes the fact that we have different needs at different times. And so some neurologists are really good at being the first one in with the new people and they can offer resources. And that's what I would look for. I would look for someone that really knows that you need a whole team that doesn't just say, hey, you have Parkinson's, bye, here's some drugs. Like I really wanted someone that could sort of, and I didn't get that, but I didn't know what I wanted until later. So for anyone who's new, that's what you want. You want someone who can build you a team who's invested in you, who listens to you and collaborates with you. The second question, the second answer to that question is as, oh, I don't know why that's happening, but happy birthday to somebody. <laughs> Um, the, the next part to that question would, would be, as you progress in your disease, you need different things. And so I no longer work with my first fantastic neurologist. He was wonderful. But I'm on with a new neurologist now who knows a lot more about DBS, my brain surgery. And he has become my movement symptom disorder specialist, just because it works out better for things moving forward. And he's better with the next range. Plus, I think he might be learning on me a little bit. Not because he's not seasoned, but because we, we can learn from each other. I'm kind of a case. And then the last part of that, I just want to answer real quickly for everyone listening, is that it's really important to have someone who has compassion. Um, doesn't matter what gender or where they're from or whatever. It doesn't even matter if you agree with them. But to have someone who can just pause and realize that you're a whole person with a family and that you have you know, very specific needs that will be changing. Um, so that's just what, what, I, what I looked for. Hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Christy. Why don't you tell us where you're coming from and and what your what you looked for, please? Uh, so, hi, I'm Christy Monica. I'm in Troy, New York. So, it's really interesting here. We don't really. I was oh, I was diagnosed in 2020. Um, we don't actually get to choose our neurologist here. If you go to the hospital where it's the main office, so at Albany Med, you don't get to choose who you want to see. But I end up being lucky enough that. I end up with like a really awesome movement specialist who is really responsive to everything. So I can email them at like night and I'll have an answer by the morning. We constantly adjust my meds. This morning I went for um, on-off testing for DBS and he's just really, really awesome. So I really lucked out. So it probably doesn't help that everyone can't be as lucky, but I really lucked out. Good. Well, I'm glad you lucked out. That's that's great to hear. Uh, uh, okay, so how about Kat? You're next on my screen. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, happy November. Um, I am, let's see, uh, diagnosed, uh, diagnosed 2015, and I am calling in today from Newport Beach, California. We arrived here yesterday. Um, let's see. Uh, for, for me, I think t compassion is really big, but I really want somebody who's going to listen and hear me and and give me feedback about what they hear. Because I, I really agree that 
um, having a chronic illness, you enter into a collaboration with your care team. And I, I really want somebody who believes that as much as I do. So, um, and it, it's taken some trial and error for me to find that person. Um, and it's worth it for me to, um, to keep the neurologist, the neurologist that I have. Also, she's younger than I am. So this is another key part so that, <laughs> so they don't go off and retire on you. That's the other piece younger than me and a good listener. How's that? That's great. Thanks. And, uh, Doug, how about you next, please? Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Reed, zooming in from Lafayette, Colorado, about 45 minutes north of Denver. Um, I was diagnosed in 2010 when I was 36, and I had DBS four years ago. Um, what I look for in a neurologist, this might be pretty basic, but uh, they have to be a movement disorder specialist. I think that's key. For about six months, right around the time I had DBS, I saw a general neurologist and I felt like he was letting me lead my own care. And it was at that point I decided I needed to go back to see a movement disorder specialist. Secondly, because I've had DBS, I wanted my movement disorder specialist to be familiar with programming DBS and specifically the Boston Scientific model that I have. Um, and he's been great. Good. Thanks, Doug. Uh, and Brian, how about you, please? Hi. Um, it's interesting. I, I had most of the, I look for uh, the neurologist, the movement disorder specialist, who, sorry, I'm having a tongue tremor, uh, who listens and responds. But I got really spoiled here when I got to Southern California because I'm with the VA. And my doctor with the VA, who's amazing, said she doesn't have enough time to help me with a lot of problems I was having, and that I should also get an outside one, and then she'll still do the medications and stuff. So what I discovered is I have a neurologist now who has a nurse navigator and a social worker on her team. And so I had a movement disorder meeting with my movement disorder specialist last week, and I wasn't looking so good because I recently had a bad fall. And so they were looking at fixing my back and then I fell and I hurt my knee really bad. She saw how bad I looked. She knows I live alone. And she had her nurse navigator and social worker find, uh, find a place where I could go into rehab. Uh, so I'm at this amazing rehab center now for the next couple of weeks. Uh, and they're fixing, they're paying attention to my speech. So I got a speech, a speech, person, whatever, occupational therapist and physical therapist. But that's all because it's a team right there in that office. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's great, Brian. I'm th I'm glad that you were able to have somebody that was so attentive to you. That's And I'm glad you're uh, in, a, in a good spot. Um, and I hope we can maybe hear some more about that as the meeting goes on. And let's get uh, Kevin, though. You're last on my screen. I need it. Um, so I agree with pretty much everything that everyone on this panel has said. Um, I've had the luxury of professionally working with a lot of movement disorder specialists. So it gives you the chance to really compare. And um, two things I would say from that is that the neurologist you start with may not be the one that you'll want to end up with currently. Um, the one piece of advice I, I got was when I recently attended an award for a Lifetime Achievement Award for a, a neurologist who's being honored for his, his lifetime work. And the keynote speech he gave when he won the award was, what I have learned from my patients over 40 years of listening to them. And to me, that really hit home because... Here was a neurologist who would probably have seen every kind of patient you, you could think of, but still was saying that every day I learn something new from my patients. That's the kind of neurologist I want, one who's curious, inquisitive, and caring. 
So I put that as sort of my criteria. You're muted. You're muted. Am, am I still muted? Oh, I'm done. Chris, but... you're muted. Sorry about that. I have a little microphone here and it's not, uh, it has a flashing light I didn't see. So um, thanks, Kevin, for wrapping that up for us with, the, with a good summary. Um, so we're going to do a question and answer session today, but uh, I know Sam has put it in the chat already that, that um, you know, we're, we're not offering medical advice. Uh, it's not our wheelhouse, but we do have practical advice. So just keep in mind that some of these questions that we get are, are sometimes hard for us to answer because we don't have all the information and we don't, everybody's circumstances are different. So please uh, don't take medical advice. Uh, don't take what we say to be medical advice and please follow up with your care team and make sure you follow what they are telling you because they know your circumstances better than, than we do for sure. Um, I want to start us off with some questions we've received recently. And um, one of them that came in that was interesting to me was just it's, it's pretty broad. But uh, I'm, I'm just going to see what we, what we have to say about it. Uh, the question was basically there are so many options pharmaceutically and the dosing seems to be a kind of moving target. So besides just consulting with a neurologist, how did you navigate the the, the variety of, of pharmaceutical options and also the the how did you deal with the dosing issues and how did you zero in? Any advice on that? Crystal Ball. I wish. <laughs> that I, I, I just completely Yoxy. trusted my neurologist, my, my MDS. Just... I keep on going off, so I'm apparently not doing it right. Uh, I think there's lots of right ways, and I think everybody's body is different, right? You know, I held off on meds. I, I was very frightened at first to start medication, and um, I wished in retrospect that I would have started earlier because I think I could have maximized the, the window of time where it would work the best for me, but um, I I think it's an individual ride. I think each of our bodies are really different. Each of our histories are different. Each of our symptoms are different. And so I think you have to be your own expert and you've got to be your own scientist a little bit around this. Um, and and know that there's a lot of right ways to do things. And, yeah, and that it- too. Yeah, with how you're feeling. Right. And let your provider know if you're not feeling well. They can't know if you don't let them know. Um, that you don't feel well and keep at it. And it, it can be such a frustrating up and down process, huh, Christy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, depending on how you let them know, it can be helpful or not. For example, my chart looks like a Shakespearean tragedy. Like, oh, I'm at the edge, doc. I'm calling you from the edge. I'm not sure I can go on. This is much too hard. I can't see the road ahead of me. It's dark out here. You know, in like, simple, maybe, succinct maybe. words, right, Heather? <laughs> I am a poet, you know, in there, and they're looking at it. The people at the front desk are going, I can see them looking at me when I'm coming in my front, but that's the one who writes us really weird messages. So just keep the facts in there if you can, <laughs> so that your doctor doesn't get flooded and they don't have to translate. <laughs> just mentioning that. Well, and if, if you do look online, make sure you're looking at reputable sites. Be careful of forums where people are just dissing out their own feedback and things that aren't substantiated. So it's very, very key that you look at the right place. Just yeah, we have some resources some about that. So. Sorry. Sorry. Just because someone has an experience with something doesn't mean that you're going to have the same experience. Everyone is different, like Kat said. Everyone has their own symptoms. Everyone responds differently. So don't always listen to everybody else. Even Don't even listen to us. I mean, right. you've listened to us a little bit today, but... <laughs> Hear us, but take but we... it your own way. <laughs> yeah. I think you should keep a log. You take your meds, then you see how you feel, how fast they kick in, how much control you're getting. And what situations are happening that make them not work as well? Uh, there's great tools out there, huh, Kevin? There's digital tools. And then there's old-fashioned tools like writing it on your calendar. Right. Or a Did you yeah. say reading? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When Kevin said that, I forgot my neurologist when I first got diagnosed had me write down how I was going throughout the day. 
with it. And that's how we were figuring out the dosage and figuring out actually the medications because then we had to switch. So that's a great one, Kevin. So there's a there's a side question to this or, or a secondary question, which was um, a question about whether starting levodopa or any treatment earlier is better. Kat, you already talked about that. But does anybody else have a perspective on your how you experienced starting immediately or not starting immediately? What do you think about that? I didn't start meds immediately because I wanted to be involved in clinical trials. Um, and I did that for a few years, and then my symptoms got so bad, I had to bow out of a clinical trial that I was in and start on meds. I'm in the exact same boat, Doug. I, I I didn't start medication immediately specifically because I wanted to be in research and I didn't want to be excluded from trials, but that was just me. As soon as I, I was not able to exercise as hard as I wanted to, I started on medication right away. That was me. Yeah, I, did I, I would same. say it depends. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kat. No, no. I was just going to say, too, that I did clinical trials also. And as soon as it started impacting me not being able to go, get to my exercise classes and work out hard, I did the same thing. That was my tipping point to start meds. In, the, in addition to Kevin's point about keeping a journal or a log, I think it's important to keep a routine. So you're taking your meds at the same time every day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Christy, did you have something you wanted to add? I just ignored my symptoms for so long that like when I was actually diagnosed, I needed to take meds right away because I was diagnosed within minutes. Yeah. Go to the doctor. Right. The first several yeah. doctors that I went to told me that it was all in my head. Oh. So when, my I PCP. Finally, when I finally did get it right, it turns out they're right. Um, when I finally did get diagnosed correctly, I just trusted the doctor and he gave me, put me on a mantidine and all this other stuff that I didn't need. In fact, my dopamine agonists for about four years were not cool. I didn't blow up any relationships. Everything's fine. So that's actually another question we had, which I'll, I'll just take a quick and a quick swipe at here, which is someone asked us about uh, dopamine agonist withdrawal and take getting off of dopamine agonist, which can be really tricky. So um, one thing I want to say about that is, uh, they, they ask specifically what kind of symptoms, um, happen associated with dopamine agonist withdrawal. Some, I you probably have some insight into that, but, uh, this is really important and you should really talk carefully with your doctor about this because it can be, it can have serious uh, repercussions for health and relationship and just, it can be a big deal. So does anybody have any perspective on that? Uh, getting off the dopamine agonist? Yeah. Yeah, so I I had to do that. I had some negative reactions to it. I had uh, obsessive behavior and and whatnot, and um, we had to taper off. And my uh, movement disorder specialist was really good at having that taper down. And then she wanted to see me more regularly because we were tapering down because I was tapering down. Uh, so that's to me the best way to do it is hand in hand with your. Uh, movement disorder specialist. Yeah, my, my new neurologist says that with young onsets, he doesn't even try dopamine agonists. The issue of obsessive compulsive disorders is so high, and he thinks it's highly underreported. And I have to agree, having experienced that same thing. Kevin, do you think that it's underreported because many of the generations who are getting diagnosed with Parkinson's aren't used to discussing their emotional and mental landscape? I think that's part of it. I think also as patients, we're ashamed of the, some of the things. We don't attribute it to our disease as much as we think, how could I be doing all this thing? It's the admission that we're having problems. Um, but I mean, I was not a happy person to be around during the period of, of the agonist. I, I just would sit there and be obsessed with people trying to do things to me. And it was not a happy place. Been there. And yeah. somebody was putting in the chat, I felt shame and embarrassed. And that was yeah. me. Big time. I did too. Yeah, me too. Same here. And I'm supposed to know better, right? This is I'm 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 the nurse, right? I'm the Oh, I'm the pharmacist. I should know. I know. Kevin, you and I right up there. 
It turns yeah. out that when you're experiencing any kind of psychosis or drug reaction, you're not really aware of it because you're too close to it. You need some perspective. You need to pull back and ask one of your touchstones, perhaps someone that knows you really well and intimately so that you can really get a, a key. It's it's not the same as saying like, are you having your period? Like what's wrong with you? It's like, hey, can I check my meds out here for a minute here? I'm acting a little bit different. I can feel it. But when your doctor says things like, do you see any strange things out of the corner of your eye? I'm like, I live in San Francisco. What do you think? So it's like, it's hard to, hard <laughs> you're on Zoom that. calls with me. Yeah. <laughs> right. I have to say that I think that Larry Gifford's um, podcast with Vicki Dillon was really helpful. So I knew what to expect. I knew what to look for. And when I noticed there's too many boxes outside my house, I had no idea what was in them. I was like, okay, it's time to come off. I'm done. It helped that my movement disorder specialist had a discussion with my husband and I before we started on them. And he really was my touch point, you know, and I'm blessed to have him. He's still here too. I'm blessed to have him still here, but he also, you know, was kind of watching for the symptoms because I, I had a heck of a time identifying it. So so that actually points to a couple of other questions that we had, and I'll, I'll give two questions at the same time that we got recently, uh, and they're sort of related, and you'll see why. Uh, one is uh, someone wrote in that their husband is experiencing uncontrolled movement, and it's making his driving unsafe. What do I do, basically? And then the second question was a little bit different, but the same sort of theme, which is uh, basically, what can I do besides putting handrails in and being careful to remain in my home as long as possible, mm -hmm. especially in the context of living alone. So mm -hmm. two, two kind of practicalities of living with Parkinson's questions that are a little different. Yeah, Kevin, go ahead. Um, I think you have to have the come to Jesus conversation with yourself. You know, I, I still drive it. And I when I sold my home, I bought myself what I said was gonna be my last car. And I've had such a great time with it. But I realize that there is another question in the list there. What I'm finding is sometimes when I'm dry, during the course of the day, I blink and they don't open. And that's not a good person to have on the road, right? Uh, and so I, I think you have to say to yourself, you know, one thing is your independence. But when are you going to become a danger to yourself or to someone else? And that's not an easy conversation to have. Uh, but I think it's really important that we all have a reality check on, I mean, I love independent living, but I do know that there's going to come a time when I'm not going to be able to do it. Uh, and I don't want to be told that it's time for you to go to, you know, assisted living. Um, but I, I want to be part of that conversation. Uh, so I, I would encourage everyone to be very objective about your safety and the safety of people around you. Yeah, Kat. Yeah, Kat. I, I think it's it's a hard situation if you're the care partner that's observing the 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 issue. Um, and I, I have an uncle with Parkinson's disease and my aunt asked me, quote, the nurse to evaluate his driving. Um, and I said what I did is I went to the Davis Finney Foundation checklist that talks about what's safe. I don't want to be the one telling somebody, somebody objective needs to help make that decision if he's not able to make that decision for himself. Perhaps enlist the help of a tool like in the uh, Every Victory Counts manual, perhaps enlist the help of your pri your primary care provider or your movement disorder specialist, because it can't always be coming from the spouse. I think, I think it's a tough, a tough thing. You know, are there kids involved? The other thing that, that can be powerful is to say, nobody is going to ride with you while you drive. Um, mm -hmm. That's a powerful statement. I've um, before. Pardon me? I've gotten that before. <laughs> But, you oh, know, no. I mean, it is a statement or or honey, the grandkids aren't going to be in the car with you if you're driving. So, I, I mean, you can only own so much of, of those pieces. And as somebody's niece, as somebody's daughter that have both given up driving, 
um, because of Parkinson's disease, it's a hard thing to discuss, but I think it it's part of that open communication that you need to be having. Coincidentally, I had an appointment earlier today with an occupational therapist and the subject of my driving came up and she offered to give me a driving assessment. Um, I didn't take her up on it, but she, I got a little nervous that she would find problems with my driving, no pressure. encourage me to give up my license. But she said, my goal is to keep you driving as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So tap into the occupational therapist resources. I have a question for the people on the panel here. If you're driving and you get in an accident, do you jump out of the car and say, sorry, I have Parkinson's? No, I jump out and I say, what are you doing? <laughs> well, there, there's an issue of liability of admitting it, right? And so it poses the question for you to say, well, if I got in an accident, how would I feel if I, if I hurt someone? Um, because if you tell them that you were driving and you have a disease that can impair you, you're really setting yourself up. I, I, I'm curious what others feel. So when I was having problems with the, um, what was it we were just talking about, the medications that with the obsessive behavior? Yeah, um, agonists. The dopamine agonists. So I had a, I passed out, had a seizure or something, um, mild seizure or something with the dopamine agonist is what they concluded. Um, and so, and I self-reported the accident because they, they hit a, uh, a bunch of bushes and, um, just whacked the bottom of the truck and knocked the mirror off. But, um, I self-reported because it scared the hell out of me. And, um, so my doctor had to sign off on me being able to drive every year for like five years. Um, and that's kind of a good thing, but that's also kind of down the line. You want to get ahead of it more. And, and what uh, Doug was saying, actually, I'm going to have them do here at the center I'm at. They they have a computerized thing that can test you because um, I've been looking at getting a new car and I'm looking at what the safety features are that can alert me if I'm doing something wrong. And is it something that I can see? Like if it's just a noise, what does that mean? Is it a lane thing? Is somebody too close? So I want to see it. So I've been looking for that kind of thing too. I think that's a good point too, that it's, you know, it's not just about Parkinson's disease. There are other diseases that our son is a type one diabetic, for example. And we, before he got his license, we had a lot of discussions around um, times where it might not be smart to get in a car. Mm -hmm. And and so if your blood sugar is low or a little unstable, that's maybe not the best time. We'd rather have you be late, not show up, not go to school, whatever, but, but get your blood sugar under control before you get and operate a car because you're putting yourself, but you're putting everybody else around you at risk too. Same thing with epilepsy or if you've had a seizure, same thing with Parkinson's, same thing with probably Alzheimer's. There's cognition issues, right? So I love the OT input. That was really great input. And I love that they've got some some um, actual tools that maybe can help you measure your response time. That's very cool. Interestingly enough, I know a lot of cops and I do take the sobriety test before getting in my car. Every single time I drive, I mm. do it because I want to know exactly, Kevin. Exactly. It really does. I don't even know me. what it is. You're going to tell me. Yeah, I can't wait. I'll show you. We're going to have so much fun <laughs> on the dance floor next time we go out. Oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, I just want to uh, drive home the, the occupational therapy point that, that, that Doug touched on, that an occupational therapist can help in so many ways at home. And, and they can, they can even do at home assessments, not at home, so to speak, they can do, they can, you know, you can walk them around with a, be careful if you do this, but you can walk them around with a camera and show that they, you know, they can do it remotely or they can come to your house. So just don't, don't overlook the value of an occupational therapist. Um, and speaking of uh, therapists that are sometimes overlooked, uh, Brian mentioned uh, speech therapy before, and somebody had asked us a question about exercises that can improve swallowing. And I don't know if anybody has any perspective on um, things that have worked well for you when you've worked with a speech language pathologist. But anyway, do anybody have any perspective on exercises for swallowing? Yeah, Brian, since you're doing it right well, now. I'm, yeah, and I'm doing it right now. 
um, because I, I told them about my tongue tremor and um, that I've had trouble swallowing my medications. And so what they're doing is they're monitoring me because I'm in this facility. They're, they're monitoring, it's an acute care facility, by the way, it's not like a nursing home. <laughs> But it's um, at breakfast this morning, they were monitoring me. And yesterday I was at lunch. And yesterday at lunch, they caught a few things. And they said, you know, one thing I hadn't figured out is if you're eating and you're coughing because you're clearing your throat, that means you're swallowing too fast or you're not having enough moisture in there. And so you need to take a sip of something. And if water isn't working, then it needs to be something like a juice uh, or or. I got it. Yes. Thank you. No, oh. <laughs> sorry. Hospital type stuff. Um, but it's, it's awesome to get that feedback uh, from a speech pathologist. Um, and then just the regular speech programs that they put you through are really hard. I found they were harder than any of the physical therapy I went through, but they're also extremely beneficial and they'll help you develop stronger muscles for swallowing, et cetera. I just saw a speech pathologist last week, and she recommended that any time I sit down to eat, I take my spoon or my fork and press it against my mouth, but forcing my tongue into it for a count of 10. And do that a couple of times. Just pushing your tongue into a stationary object is strengthening the muscle. I've done that before. Um, so anyway, moving right along, I think maybe for swallowing to maybe gargling, also making the noises as if, as if you were warming up for singing, um, opening the mouth more. And, you know, obviously you need a mirror to do this because we don't know how we look. We can only see the people in front of us and so on and so forth. And I've also been told like a warm honey tea can help out, which is what my friend yeah, Mike yeah. does before our podcast. Many people get Botox in their throats as well. And that sounds really painful, but might help. I don't know. The, the warm fluids is a great one too. One of my fellow Davis Finney Foundation ambassadors told me that at his peddling for Parkinson's classes, the one person will ask a question and then they'll go around shouting out the answer. So just sh oh. shouting and repetitive yelling. Yeah. So you could add that to your exercise classes. What's your favorite food? French fries. <laughs> if aliens came to Earth to observe us in that exact moment, what would they do? That? <laughs> like the warm-ups for theater, theater students. I've been trying to sing really loud in my car. You know, just you're still married. <laughs> Well, I know, and I'm still married. I don't do it with Ken in the car. I see him. <laughs> <laughs> you might check in with him later about how he feels about that. <laughs> Same. Yeah. Singing yeah. in the car, Christy. Yeah. Yeah. With yeah. By Brian. myself. I don't need that. Mark doesn't yeah. need that. And it's fun. Hi. I find it lifts my mood, too, depending yes. on what I'm listening to. So this this actually relates to something that I don't think we actually need to uh, go too deep into, but somebody sent us a comment a while back that said, do you know about drumming for Parkinson's? And the answer is, yeah, we have some content about that on our website, but music in general can can have you do some dual task things. So if you, and that can be useful in a, in a variety of ways. So, but yeah, drumming is a great thing to do for for coordination and, and, and all that. Yeah, there he is. Go Kevin, go. Yeah, we need it, we need volume, man. Are you muted? No, I just we want to hear your concert, well. man. We want to hear your your. He's That's got a impressive. drum. He's got a guitar. Can you do the ukulele and the drum at the same time? Yeah, play yourself a cajon drum. Love it. So, yeah. I want to I want to look at another question, um, a, a set of questions actually about sleep and and mornings and and difficulties with both sides of this. So uh, we have three questions and I, I'm sorry to do this to you panelists, but I'm gonna ask three questions at a time. It's terrible of me. Um, we got a question about nausea on waking and how do you deal with sleep issues that relate to that? You know, you 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 take your first dose of the day, of the day and, and it makes you nauseous. And then not only are you waiting for it to kick in, but you're laying in bed and you feel nauseous at the same time. That's one thing. Any tips on morning waking up and dose uh, regulation? 
another question just generally about what do you do to get ready to go in the morning or do you experience fatigue that's more extreme and then um, a question about falling asleep and and um, having a hard time staying asleep so both sides of the spectrum and yeah christy go ahead take a take okay. a crack at it so i was having a really hard time sleeping and i just take trazodone now every night and i was really reluctant to take it but now i just take it every night because it really helps me fall asleep I fall asleep within like 10 minutes. And if I get up, I go to the bathroom and I go back to sleep. It's it's amazing. I've, I, I'm so lucky that it works. I'm so happy. Christy, because, does it affect your ability to get to the bathroom um, safely? No. Okay. No. I only take one. I can take up to two, but two, two is too much. One is like perfect. I can like walk. I can move like the same as I could before. Like it's not... I mean, I can't move very well at night, but I can get up, get up from get get to the bathroom. Um, and waking in the morning, I have to wake up an hour earlier than what I need to, because I have to shuffle to shuffle to the let the dogs out and shuffle to the couch after I take my meds to let them let myself come to life. Mm -hmm. It takes about an hour before yeah. I can see the shower, so I have to build that in to like my morning routine. Yeah, and some of us are going through menopause simultaneously, which is an extra special oh. bonus. <laughs> when you baking, soaking baking wet and shuffling. And trying to roll over and get out of bed and soaking wet. It's like, oh. <laughs> oh. Great. Something to look forward to. Because if sweating, sweating like profusely isn't enough. <laughs> yeah. It's so a great. glamorous life we have. Really. No, it's so great. It's so sexy. Somebody asked a question earlier in the chat about diluting carbidopa, levodopa, and water. Right. And, and my my former movement disorder specialist, when I took carbidopa, levodopa, I'm off it completely now because of DBS. But when I took it, he recommended that I dissolve my first dose in water because he suggested that it would be absorbed faster. Huh. I said to chew it. Also taking vitamin C or some sort of little bit of fruit juice or something that has a little bit of a pop to it, maybe a little fizz. Seltzer. Somebody commented sparkling water. I think there's, you know, that carbonic acid, that little bit of acid in there may help it absorb. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it get absorbed in the small intestine though? Yeah, but it'll help it break it down. I think, I don't know, Ken, you have to comment. Yeah. We need Kevin's special tea. For dealing with nausea, maybe uh, have some ginger snaps with breakfast. Doug, you mentioned earlier um, having a, 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 a ritual or something very um, organized. I find that in order to wake up in the morning, I, I almost go immediately into exercise. So I, I have my ritual where I brush my teeth and do 50 squats while I'm brushing. Uh, and then afterwards, I'll stand on one leg because I've heard that mortality is tied to balance. And those become the morning ritual. It's even before coffee now. It used to be coffee first. But now I do this just as I get up. And I'm finding actually that routine works well for me. Kevin, I wish you had a body cam or someone had a camera. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. I'm uh, thinking that that routine might lead to my more mortality. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> that most but of I'm impressed. I'm super impressed. Yeah, squat, and brush, squat and brush. I'm super. That's amazing. All right. I'm going to try it, Kevin. I'll I'm get down to step back. Okay step back to one question I, I wanted to chime in on that I, I didn't have the word for it, now I do but for getting to sleep um I do the melatonin but I get it at Costco where they sell them that can uh go into <laughs> sublingual which is under the tongue and so I do two five five milligram tablets under the tongue and by the time they dissolve I'm pretty much asleep um because they get into the system so fast and it's all natural I so, have not hard to go back and forth but then. I have not figured out the sleep thing. I, I sheer exhaustion helps me to sleep better after a course of five or six days of not sleeping well, 
<laughs> regular exercise helps me, um, you know, a really good hard workout. Um, but sometimes that can make me more dystonic. I, I think it's an up and down thing. And, um, and I think, pardon the expression. Yeah. The up and down thing. You got that Heather. Heather's cracking up. <laughs> I always say, you know, I'm going to sleep later, you know, in my next life. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I miss a whole day, a whole night's sleep at least once a week. Yeah. Sometimes three times a week when I'm having a bad week, but yeah, there's nights you just can't do it. That's why we have the insomniac gallery. <laughs> How do you have so much time to paint Heather? Well, I have trouble falling asleep. I can fall asleep anywhere doing literally anything, which hasn't gone very well for my relationships. However, I don't stay asleep. I'm up at two and four and it's like, I'm just up all the time. You'll see me on like Twitter or something in the middle of the night. I can't sleep, you know, welcome to the insomniac club because it's hard to sit still. You can't really do anything worthy of your time. It's not like you can do your taxes or something. You can't concentrate. So it's, yeah. it's, it's empty space. Might be more accepting of it also I think getting upset about it and staring at the clock hasn't been helpful and so um depending on if you can build it into your life to to take a take a nap to give yourself permission to rest a little bit the next day or maybe not expect so much from yourself the day after you haven't had a good night's sleep um you know, not everybody has the luxury of that. You know, many people have to go to jobs or are raising kids or um, have a schedule that isn't flexible. But if you do, maybe giving yourself some space around that and and flexing a bit with it. I'm, I don't have a super regimented um, medication schedule or wake sleep schedule. And, and I, I try to accept that my days are going to be different. I know like on our travel days, I need to be a little bit more scheduled. So I'm, I'm careful <laughs> that I give myself enough time in the morning to get up and get ready and moving and then to get in the car. And I may need actually more doses of carbidopa, levodopa, the day that we're traveling. And, and I, I have an agreement with my movement disorder specialist around some as needed dosing. Um, so I think, again, we're back to that. We just don't have one, a one size, one answer fits all kind of thing. There's just so many different ways to do it. So I have a, I have a thing that works well for me. And I'm curious, I'd love to hear from, from you all on the panel, if you, and then from anybody in the audience, if you try this with regard to staying asleep, it, it's like, works like a charm for me. It's like magic. It's like a magic bullet for stay, for getting back to sleep. I breathe in for a four count, doesn't matter how long it is, but I breathe out for a seven count. And just something about thinking fours and sevens, because that, like, that, that's like the adding four and seven when, the, when you do the cognitive the assessments. Track, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, something about it, it just makes me go right back to sleep. It's like a, it's a godsend for me. So if you try it, let me know how it works. Um, I want to jump over so, to some questions about uh, DBS, tremor, and dystonia. Um, and just, I know a number of the, we got a bunch of questions about dystonia, but uh, I'll ask the one of, one of them here. So uh, we got a question about uh, someone who's a little hesitant to, to try or to go down the DBS path and they're being encouraged because of uh, some, partially because of some dystonia. So they're, they're asking for perspective on DBS for dystonia, basically. Anybody have any input? Being I, somewhat I, stiff, not shaky, I can just say that I had not the subthalamus nucleus one, the GPI, and I couldn't lower my medications because of it, and it hasn't gone great for me. But that doesn't mean that it wouldn't work for someone else. So I wouldn't be against it. Be aware, though, that some of the after effects of brain surgery tend to be very close to a traumatic brain injury. I wish someone would have warned me about that first. But yeah, it does work for some people. And I think from my experience with DBS and co-leading a support group, DBS, from my understanding, is approved to help with tremor, rigidity, and slowness of movement. I'm not sure if dystonia falls in that, those three buckets, and I think it's kind of hit or miss if DBS will alleviate dystonia or not. 
unfortunately. Kevin, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, you know, um, I've been ha my neurologist at Stanford even suggested putting a third lead in, which I didn't want to do at the time. Um, I, I'm finding that all the adjustments on on for for my increasing dystonia aren't really helping, and I'm really relying on outside physical therapy to try to combat the issues with dystonia. I think there's there's still learning a lot about dystonia and where it comes from and the origins. Um, so I don't think they had the answer. Some people tell me that they with an, an adjustment, their dystonia goes away. But I, I, I don't hear that as often as I'd like to hear. Uh, I, I'm looking for the magic bullet for dystonia myself. Me too. Well, and it's, I, I have dystonia in the feet. And it's interesting. I read recently the most young onset um, diagnosis is for Parkinson's come because they have dystonia in the feet. Um, but I get treated and I've been treated with this for five or six years now. Every three months I get um, Botox in my feet. And um, that helps tremendously. And before that happened, I was in complete and utter pain. I was like, just take the feet. Just, I don't care. Yeah. It was so bad. And, uh, and the, the, the Botox really helped. And I've been asked to pose in uh, feet magazines because they're so sexy now. So, uh, kidding. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I do the same for my hands every three months for my fingers and it's spreading. It's starting to go to multiple fingers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I know Kev that's, did you have Botox, Kevin? In yeah, I did Botox, fingers, feet, yeah. eyes, and parotids for drooling. Got it. Can you tell My them dad why you did parotids. What's that? Sorry, sorry. Can you tell them why you got it in your eyes? I don't think people know what you mean. Oh, I get it in my eyelids because when I blink, the eyes don't open sometimes. And your vein about crow's feet. Oh, well, there you go. It's all about Look looking at good. Look how useful right? he is. Look at that. It's so he can continue his modeling career. There right? you go. There In you my go. mind, right? Only can. <laughs> but okay, so let's let's move on to a question because I want to get to it before we're, we're at the end of our time today, which we're coming up on, um, which is uh, any tips for anxiety around off time. Pulling out exercise. the big guns at the end. I'm on all ears. Yeah. Exercise. I, I try to just get out and breathe and exercise, singing in the car. Do something I know makes me feel good. And I go back to having the routine and the same pattern every day. So you'll you can journal and notice when you're getting disconnected and document it and then you can discuss it with your movement disorder specialist and you can mentally prepare yourself for going off or however your meds affect you on a day-to-day -day basis i listen to you i go off so many times a day me too I think one thing I try to remind myself is that everything is impermanent and that it's a flowing state. Like mm -hmm. when you meditate and you can watch your, your mind a little bit as the witness, you just sort of watch your thoughts go by. If you can do that with your off times, you're a boss because you can say to yourself, you know, kind of like, remember when you were in high school or uh, grade school, you thought like, this is your whole world and everything was such a big deal. You thought you'd be with these people for the rest of your life. Thank goodness. That's not true. Same thing with your off times. Picture it like the mean girls are here, but you can say bye-bye in an hour. You have to deal with them while they're there. But they're going to be gone. You know Hopefully. what I mean? I think mindfulness, and I'll quote from Michael J. Fox in his movie, Still, I'm waiting for the bus or I'm on the bus between doses. And I can feel it come on, and when I'm on the bus, I feel okay. <laughs> I also am going to say acceptance too. Don't add self judgment or shame on top of anxiety. It's hard enough to manage and ride the anxiety train or the bus 
I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to paraphrase there, Kevin, but you know, it, let's try to be gentle with ourselves and accept that this is hard and, um, and even make a list of tools that might help because I don't know about you when I'm in an anxious moment, my brain can't think very well. So go to that list. Okay. You know, phone a friend. It's like your, what are your lifelines? And sometimes the bus is just late. We need to accept that sometimes it's late. Sometimes it's off schedule. It happens. Yeah. They will get there eventually. And you're not alone. Know that you're not alone. That we see you. We hear you. <laughs> we are. There's, there's probably other people waiting for that bus too. Yeah. And we yeah. shame ourselves because of how it affects others as well. So it's like we get double shame. So just remember that, you know, a lot of people just aren't even paying attention. Like you might feel totally off and people don't even notice. They're too busy looking at their phones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Good point, Heather. So this, uh, uh, another thing that is sometimes uh, an anxiety provoker is leg fatigue and getting legs and gait issues sorted out. I mean, I'm, I'm asking hard questions at the end, but... Um, I wonder if anybody has any perspective on on tips for for navigating when your legs just don't want to go the way you want them to go. Patience. Yeah. Again, it's temporary usually, but don't don't push yourself because I think that's when falls can happen. Yeah, I and think. I, I... Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I, I get in the habit because my leg, I have a leg tremor. And so sometimes it's not so good. So I have a habit of bringing a cane when I go out in public. Uh, and if I feel good, I'll leave it in the car. And if I feel bad, I can go and get it. Or if I just feel bad enough that it's not going to be good enough. I, so I always have a cane in the car. Have your tools ready, right? Evan mentioned to me once he had a walking stick to cue where the ground is, not to hold on to it and lean on, but just so we could cue where the ground is and look up instead of down. It also cues other people. It, once again, they have to be paying attention. You know, it, it cues other people to sort of give you just a little more space. You know, you, you get some stairs, but who cares, you're safer. Yeah. I, have a, I have a walking stick in my car, like for, for hiking or that I can use when I walk anywhere that I can just pull out if I need it. Yeah, pretty I, if you want to get them. I go almost everywhere with a walking stick now, but I don't always use it. But if the one tip that I would do is slow it down a little bit and think about posture. If you actually stop stooping over and just elevate up, I find that the steps kind of come a little easier at that point. Back to that in the moment, right, Kev? Right. Mindful. Uh, yeah. Kevin, I have a question about that. Do you find that it's it's upper body? I mean, you know, we we hunch over maybe, but do you do you have to focus on your posture at your hips too? Like like, are you rotating your? Tell me more. Well, it's it's this entire thing of just lift. So it's back, shoulders. And even thinking about a, a, a string pulling your head up, it's almost like, like a dancer's skill set that they go through. Um, and if I do that, it doesn't always help it, but it gets me back into getting back into a rhythm on my gait. So the reason I asked about the hips is that for, for me, I've just started to have some gait issues that are, uh, are are difficult for me. And I find that one of the things for me is I know I my hips are, I'm always like tucking my myself into like this little ball. And if I, I have to lift starting by rotating my, my, my lower body back. So I'm like pushing back through my butt almost. Yeah. And that's, if I don't do that, I can't get upright. Like you're, like you're describing, I can't pull myself forward or, or up from the shoulders I have to start at my hips. You mean well, like that's you when you brush your teeth, you got to do your squats. I, you know, I, I love that. I am going to start squatting in the morning because I bet you that would help with some other issues I have too, with just some hamstring and knee problems. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw the balloons up on your comment. I, I well, I look. I'll take balloons any time of the day. Um, 
So we're speaking of time of the day, we're at our time. So I think we'll we'll wrap up, but I want to just um, say thanks to everybody for asking us the questions that you sent in and, and please continue to send them and we'll, we'll try to do as, as best we can to answer the questions as they come into us.